All right, Ryan and Aaron, go for the review. All right, are we able to see the slides? Yes. Great. Yes. Um, so thanks so much for to everyone for coming and to um, Learning Analytic Network for this great series. Uh, this session is Algorithmic Bias in Education by Ryan Baker and myself. Um, so in the, in the past several years, algorithmic bias has made its fair share of headlines uh, from complaints about gender bias in credit limits for the Apple card uh, to gender bias in online ads for employment and housing to racial bias in how intensive healthcare is distributed or probably most famously racial bias in predicting the risk of recidivism after parole. While in education, the cases and the possible harms are less well known, um, concerns over algorithmic bias have been around since at least the 1970s when a medical school in the UK built a computer program for screening applicants based on its own past admissions decisions and along the way baked racial and gender discrimination into their screening process for almost 20 years. Um, more recently, a grading scandal hit the news in the UK when a hand-coded program for adjusting teacher-given A-level scores was seen to be biased against students coming from lower income backgrounds. With them, um, increased use of predictive analytics in education, both in academia and industry, it seems like just a matter of time before the next algorithmic bias scandal in education is upon us. As we see from these past cases in education, algorithmic bias in a popular historical sense seems to apply to um, computer processes resulting in systematic unfair outcomes for some groups over other groups. The research we're discussing today deals specifically with cases where bias is the product of a machine learning process, and even more specifically with situations where model performance is better or worse across mutually exclusive groups. Ultimately though, we should care about algorithmic bias, not just because of model performance, but because of the possible real world harms that can impact specific groups. And research, and out research outside of education has explored two broad types of related harms. Um, allocative harms, which result from the withholding of some opportunity or resource from particular groups, or even the unfair distribution of a benefit across groups. Uh, more recent work has identified and turned to a discussion of representational harms, which manifest as the systematic representation of some group in a negative light, or simply a lack of positive representation. In tracing the origins of bias, the main approach has been to describe the stages of a machine learning process and then connect possible forms of bias to each of those stages. So descriptions of the machine learning pipeline vary. These are some of the possible stages that we saw across a few different sources. Um, developers creating an algorithmic solution move from the actual world, the world as it is, to defining a task related to that world, to pulling together or creating a data set, to defining, training, and testing a model, and finally to putting the model into practice in some manner, whether that's automated and behind the scenes or as a form of communication to decision makers. Throughout this cycle, there are multiple points of entry for bias, and a lot of work in computer science has attempted to map kinds of bias onto the, the places where they're most likely to occur in the pipeline. Researchers have um, written extensively about the model learning stage of the life cycle and how different metrics for fairness can be used to audit models for bias. Kizilcek and Lee have a great review that brings the, the broader research on modeling from computer science into the education context in a really useful way. As a complement, our focus here is more on the role of measurement and data collection as a source of bias, while also consolidating what we know about algorithmic bias in education as it impacts specific groups 
And finally, on suggesting some broad strategies for mitigating the bias that can arise in the measurement data collection stage of the machine learning pipeline. So digging into that um, measurement data collection stage, one of the most common forms of bias that arises is representational bias, where a model performs less well for groups that are underrepresented in the training data. It may seem obvious, but still important to highlight that suburban middle-class students are not the same as urban lower income students, yet research and ed tech often end up developing their models with more affluent schools, many of which can be more open to research partnerships because they have more resources to manage disruptions to their schedules and can also feel less pressure under state accountability systems to increase test scores. Another piece of the puzzle for representational bias is to remember that even a complete data set from one setting may not be sufficient to avoid bias if important groups are only rarely represented in that data. The other major form of bias stemming from measurement data collection is one of the most concerning and can be more difficult to tease out. And that's bias in the measurement itself, whether in the choice of training labels or stemming from some moment in the coding process. If, for example, some type of school records like discipline incidents, suspensions, or grades are used as the predicted value, these records can bring in the biased judgments of individuals. Teachers and administrators, for example, assign behavior infractions that then culminate in suspensions and make decisions about grades that accumulate to GPAs. Systematic bias in these judgments, or even in the intensity with which some groups of students are monitored over other groups may lead to bias in how we measure and operationalize the factors that we most want to predict. Um, even labels generated by asking students to self-report can be impacted by factors such as stereotype threat or cultural interpretation. And while easier to control, humans labeling of data can also be prone to misinterpretation due to cultural differences. So while it can be difficult to pin down the source of bias after the fact, representation and measurement bias are two possible causes to keep in mind as we look at some of the existing evidence of how models in education perform more or less well for, for different groups. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan there. Thank you, Aaron. So one of the first steps when we kind of want to move from these theoretical perspectives an algorithmic bias to trying to solve problems is to say, what do we know? And there's this uh, continuum, not continuum, process here that you can see where, you know, we start with unknown biases. We don't know what the problem is. We want to move from there to known biases uh, where we know what the problem is. We haven't fixed it yet, but at least we know. Hard to fix it until you know. And most of the work that's been done today is in the is in kind of this first step, but from there um, we hope that we can get to fairness and then to equity. So, what do we know about bias impacting learners in common demographic categories? Nice quote from uh, Ken Holstein and his colleagues who are studying industrial teams' attitudes towards algorithmic bias in education where Ken and colleagues noted that teams often struggled to anticipate which subpopulations and forms of unfairness they needed to consider for specific kinds of machine learning applications. In other words, people know that there's algorithmic bias out there, but they don't know uh, where it lies. You know, we, we, we have our stereotypical beliefs about it that we get from like society and from knowing about biases in other areas, but that doesn't mean we know what's going on in education. And Concerningly, as Paquette and his colleagues uh, demonstrated, most educational data mining research, um, I think we'd find the, the same thing in learning analytics, but Paquette's review was focused on the EDM conference and the ED, journal of EDM. Most educational data mining research doesn't even mention learner demographics, much less do any research on it. And if we're not even reporting in a paper that the learners are 90% a member of a certain group, well, how can we know that, uh, you know, if we're not even reporting at that level, how can we know uh, what findings we can use? Um, in terms of what's been published, I'm gonna give a quick review. This is from uh, Aaron and my paper uh, that we have. Uh, it's up on Ed, Ed Archive, it's under review. Um, 
So we reviewed the extant literature on algorithmic bias. We found that in terms of race and ethnicity, there were a few papers. Um, for example, a range of algorithms pre predicting course failure performed worse for African-American students, but the results differ across university courses. Henry Anderson is in the audience right now. I hope I'm not misrepresenting your work, Henry. Uh, Anderson et al. 2019 found that algorithms predicting sixth year graduation had higher false positive rates for white students and higher false negative rates for Latino students. This is one of these cases uh, where it, um, it, you know, you're getting differential impact on different groups. And just because you're saying that more people in one group are gonna graduate or that they're gonna fail doesn't, you know, it, it's got different meanings, right? Uh, it's got different risks. Lee and Kizilchek reported that an algorithm for predicting course grades performed worse for students in underrepresented racial and ethnic groups in their sample than for white and, and Asian students. And uh, you at all found that when race data was included in models, practice that I find very concerning, by the way, when race data is included in models, students of several racial backgrounds were inaccurately predicted to perform worse than other students in terms of undergraduate success. Nationality, another category that's had a little more study, although largely due to one research group. Um, so on a test of foreign language proficiency, uh, the E-Rater system for grading essays gave students from certain nationalities uh, higher scores than human essay raters. In specific, um, Chinese and Korean students were given higher scores and Arabic and Hindi speaking students were given lower scores. And this, you can imagine, is gonna be problematic in both directions because the students who are assessed to have lower proficiency than they actually do might be uh, thresholded by a graduate program and not, um, not given admission, even though they uh, have enough fluency to succeed in the program. But students who have actually lower fluency than the algorithm thinks are gonna have a different problem, which is that they may be put into uh, language courses that are too difficult for them. So kind of both sides of this are problematic. In a second uh, body of research, Ogan and her colleagues showed that models of student help seeking built using data from learners in the Philippines, Costa Rica, and the US were each more accurate on students from their own countries than for students from the other countries. <coughs> Gender. Um, <clears> Hu <throat> and Rangwala found that a bunch of algorithms predicting course failure were worse for male students, although the results weren't consistent. Anderson and colleagues found that um, algorithms predicting college graduation had higher false negative rates for male students. Flipping over, Gardner uh, found that algorithms predicting MOOC dropout predict performed worse for female students than male students. Lean Kizilchek found that an algorithm for predicting course grades were worse for males than female students. And uh, you and colleagues found that female students were inaccurately predicted to perform better for undergraduate success than male students. So the patterns here aren't entirely consistent. It's not like the algorithmic bias in terms of gender is all going in one direction. It's kind of all over the place, but individually taken, there are several examples that models are worse for one gender than another. Now, it may be that there's actually a consistent reason for this, but it may not be. A couple other studies. Um, uh, Kai et al. found a model for, uh, for student retention uh, did better uh, for female students than male students, although it did decently for both. They also found that JRIP decision rules, a more conservative algorithm, was more equitable than J48. One, uh, one paper kind of con contrary to all the other ones, or sorry, two papers, Christie et al. and Riazi et al. found only small differences between males and females. But still, we're talking several papers that find differences in algorithm goodness, only a couple finding a lack of difference. So I've quickly reviewed the results, what there is around race, gender, and nationality. I wanna point out that although we have a few papers there, it's still actually pretty pretty sparse compared to uh, a lot of other research problems. It, take all the research on, I don't know, something like gaming the system. Why there's been literally dozens of papers on gaming the system and yet so few on uh, these issues. What do we know about bias impacting other groups? There's just not enough research. And we may not even know all the groups that are impacted. For instance, native language and dialect. It seems plausible that a lot of algorithms might work less well 
on people not working in their native language than in, uh, than in their native language. And in fact, algorithmic essay scoring often is developed on corpuses that are more relevant to native speakers than second language speakers. And when Aaron and I looked through the literature, we couldn't find any work on algorithmic bias in education in terms of learner dialect. Now, Finkelstein and colleagues have built learning systems that are appropriate for speakers of non-traditional dialects, but that's very different than saying, do the algorithms used to make inferences work equal, equally well? And in fact, I've had conversations not in the not too distant past, even of developers of natural language processing systems for English, where uh, they get fluent speakers of English from around the world to study their accents, but they don't get people from the United States or Great Britain with widely variant accents uh, for this. And that's, that's an interesting challenge. I mean, learners from around the world are important, but anybody who's spent time in various parts of the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, is gonna say that, um, that you know, people who grow up speaking language don't always necessarily sound the same. I think everybody knows that, and yet we haven't seen research on it. Disabilities, not nearly enough work on algorithmic bias and disabilities. Lukina and colleagues found that a speech recognition system was less effective for students with a speech impairment. Um, Riazi and colleagues found that there was disparate impact in course outcome prediction for students who self-reported they had some disability. Urbanicity. Um, I know of two studies on urbanicity. Uh, there's a third unpublished one that we didn't discuss. Um, Okampan colleagues found that detectors of student affect, emotion and context were less effective when they were transferred between urban, rural and suburban students. Uh, but Sam and all looked at the same issue among attributes of student questions, didn't find a difference in that area. Now, this one I don't consider to be kind of two findings that contradict each other. These are two findings about different problems. Um, there's been some other unpublished work on affect detectors that suggests that they are they have the same issues that uh, Okampa found. I've been urging those folks to publish. Um, I'm also aware of some work showing that a lot of widely used findings on intelligent tutoring systems don't apply uh, across urban, rural, suburban uh, breakdowns. Not quite the subject of our paper, but still relevant. Parental educational background. Sorry if this feels like a little bit of a brain dump, but I hope it's interesting. Um, there, there have been some kind of uh, disagreeing findings in terms of this, where you and colleagues have found that models predicting college success, thank you, I appreciate the positive feedback. Models predicting college success are more likely to inaccurately predict negative outcomes for first generation college students, if you put in the model. But um, Kai and colleagues found a uh, contrary finding that model predicting retention and online program was more accurate for first generation college students. So the two papers that investigated these issues um, kind of seem to kind of be disagreeing, but they both agree that the models are unequally effective. And I see in the chat the question, will the slides be available? Yes, we will make the slides available on the Learning Analytics Learning Network website. And everything that we're talking about here is in our paper, which you can find on Ed Archive. Or just go into Google Scholar, Baker, Hahn, Algorithmic Bias in Education. Socioeconomic status. Um, you and colleagues found that models predicting college success are more likely to inaccurately predict negative outcomes for students from poor family if you put the personal background in the model. A lot of times people think if you put the demographic variables in the model, it'll make it better. But you has a lot of these. I hope you've been noticing this across these slides. You has a lot of examples where it actually makes the models worse. Um, and Udelson and colleagues found kind of one of those ambiguous results where models predicting student success were less accurate, but not that much less accurate if they were transferred between schools with different socioeconomic status profiles. International students. Um, models predicting college success, more likely to inaccurately predict negative outcomes for international college students if you put it in the model. Military connected status, kids who have a parent or close relative in the military. These are um, an interesting group because they have a lot of mobility. Thank you, Tanya, I appreciate you putting that on the window. 
They have a lot of mobility. Um, they have a lot of uh, stressors that not every other kid has. And Baker and colleagues, um, I wonder who that is. Baker and colleagues found that models predicting high school dropout were less accurate if they were developed for students who weren't military connected and then applied to military connected students or vice versa. So in other words, the common practice of building models on kind of all the students you have, which is mostly not military connected, and then applying them on military connected students actually doesn't do very well. So finding after finding after finding in these one or two paper cases, the bias impacts a wide range of groups. And that's kind of terrifying because honestly, who here in this audience would have said that military connected was gonna be one of the categories that they were gonna say, we got to study, right? Like it's not very studied by academics, but it made a difference. So what are the groups that we haven't yet had that one or two papers on uh, that are also impacted? I, I think, Aaron, I think you and I would agree, there's probably a lot of them and we just don't know. That's not saying that every single division you can think of is gonna be predictive. It's possible that people who really like to listen to, uh, to 1980s Finnish rock music aren't all that different from other people. Um, although probably that's a pretty small sample group. Um, but we don't know what groups are impacted. That's a big problem. Other takeaways overall from this body of research. Models trained on one group of learners generally perform more poorly for new groups. This doesn't seem like rocket science, but you see a lot of cases where people are doing it in the real world, right? Um, there's so many cases where model predictive analytics models are built. My gosh, who here's heard of the Chicago model? You know, Alan Worth and Easton built this model on kids in Chicago to predict who was going to drop out, and it's used nationwide. It's used in suburban districts. It's used in rural areas. Why would we expect that a model from Chicago in the 1990s will be relevant in um, almost anywhere else today? You know, maybe it's still relevant in Chicago. Maybe it's relevant in cities that look a lot like Chicago. It's not relevant in all the places it's being used. We need investigation of bias for many groups. Astute people watching this might have said, my gosh, where's all the papers on indigenous learners? There aren't. We didn't find any papers really documenting this for indigenous learners. Hat tip to Henry Anderson. Henry looked at this issue. He didn't have enough Native American learners in his sample to study it, but he actually like, pointed that out. But we don't see many papers on indigenous learners. We don't see papers on specific disabilities for the most part. We don't see papers on non-binary and transgender learners. I have a colleague who submitted a grant proposal on this, got it rejected because the reviewers didn't think it was important. It's really important. These learners are being affected and we don't know how much and in what situations. All kinds of other groups that I'm sure people could just list out that I haven't even thought of. Collecting and training on a diverse set of samples, sorry, Collecting and training a diverse sample of students can help, but we've got to have a real effort if we're going to get learners from particularly groups that aren't just underrepresented, but just aren't very prevalent. And that also occurs when we have, you know, strong unevenness of sample across regions. Indigenous learners. Indigenous learners in most countries are concentrated in certain areas. Um, if you've got the infinite campus data set for dropout prediction, you're doing amazing with indigenous learners. If you've got one of the other national samples, you're probably not, because it just so happens that infinite campus uh, has a state contract in South Dakota, uh, has a state contract, I think, in uh, Arizona. Okay, so. Now we've talked a little bit about the known biases. Where do we go from there to fairness and equity? <clears throat> I'd like to discuss a few steps on the path forward. So two key obstacles that Aaron and I in our review uh, kind of talk about, focus on for overcoming bias. The first one I've already kind of talked about a little bit, lack of data on group membership, sorry. There's not having a sample, and then there's lacking data on the membership. You could have a lot of people in your sample who belong to underrepresented groups, but you don't know which are which. And the other one is a lack of transparency on bias and group-specific outcomes. So lack of data on group membership. How did we get here? We have a data set that has 600,000 kids in it, 
and we don't know which ones belong to different groups. The big answer is two things, privacy risks and regulatory, legal, and IRB risk restrictions. Um, lack of transparency on bias and group-specific outcomes. How do we get here? There's strong commercial incentives against transparency in group data collection. Um, companies that collect this kind of stuff leave themselves open to being critiqued for violating privacy. Also, um, in the United States, at least, we have these two big databases for determining if, curric you know, if a curriculum is effective. And if you want to sell your product to a lot of districts, you've got to be in the evidence for ESSA database or the What Works Clearinghouse. And both of these treat evidence like it's universal. A curriculum that's shown to work in one, studies, one study is effective. A curriculum that has two studies that show it doesn't work is ineffective. A curriculum that has two on each side has mixed effectiveness. No consideration that maybe the two places that worked were urban and the two places that failed to work were rural or vice versa. How do we fix these problems? Well, I'm gonna talk about four directions. Improving data collection, improving tools and resources, facilitating and incentivizing openness and broadening the community. Improving data collection. Collect data on the variables that we have some reason to believe matter. Uh, like gender, race, ethnicity, native language, national origin, origin, parental educational background. There's a lot of other variables that don't have sufficient evidence about them to make broad recommendations today, but that's due to the lack of research on these aspects of identity. Regulators, IRBs. You know, unfortunately, IRBs are not seen in all countries, institutional review boards. What they do is they make sure that research is ethical and they make sure subjects are protected, or at least that's the goal. I sat on an IR, a university IRB for a few years and that's that people are well-meaning, but to a large extent, they're driven by the way these things are designed to try to follow the regulations more than they're driven to try to make a big difference. So can we encourage regulators and IRBs to balance the risks of privacy violations with the risks of algorithmic bias? It's really easy for an institutional review board to say, don't collect any demographic data. That way you can't leak demographic data and violate privacy. But if that causes us to be making biased models and not being able to show our models aren't biased or not being able to show where they are biased, that's a really big problem. In the long term, algorithmic bias may end up being a bigger problem than privacy. Although of course they're both big problems, but we have to have a balance. And right now the regula regulatory environment in the United States and many other countries actually many countries worse than the United States, is much more tilted towards protecting privacy than avoiding algorithmic bias. You gotta start trying to move the needle back the other way. Now, there are potential ways to reduce privacy risks while still being able to use the fuller information we need to conclude that there's algorithmic bias going on. There's, there's a lot, but three that uh, seem particularly promising. One, data obfuscation. When you've got, say, only three members of a specific group, kind of collapse that group in with other groups. When you have kind of a situation where individual students could be identified, kind of merge variables or, mer or give ranges rather than specific values to kind of obfuscate that. A second approach, which we use in the MOOC replication framework at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Michigan, is that we have a framework that allows people to analyze but not view the data. So you can do an analysis with the full data. You can output certain controlled output functions from Python, but you can't actually look at the data directly, which makes it much harder to violate privacy. Now, I'll be the first to admit that our approach isn't perfect and it's a little hard to use for those uh, who've tried to use it, but we're working on that. And if anyone's interested in using our framework, we'd love to share it. Third approach that the assistance project uses is legal agreements before access. Assistments um, gets rid of uh, obvious personally identifying information, but they also require anyone analyzing their data to sign a legal agreement saying that they're not gonna try to re-identify the data. Improving data collection. Create practices for making sure that training sets are representative. Let's, uh, let's, you know, let's formalize this. Make sure that we're representing uh, key groups. And that in part comes from what samples you choose it's really easy to pick the convenience sample of learners that are kind of a mile from your university. To the extent that we can get much more representative samples 
from a little more work, it's really valuable. And as a field, we need to create methods for determining how much data you need for subpopulations within the data set. We don't have a good set of power analyses to say that for a specific kind of analysis, you need 30 learners from an underrepresented group or 70. That kind of uh, information would really help us to, um, to design our studies. Avoid or reduce bias during the labeling process. Uh, Oker and her colleagues demonstrate that when you have people doing cross-cultural data coding, such as coding emotion, it leads to systematic inaccuracies in training labels. So Americans trying to code people from Turkey and their emotions, not only were wrong a lot more than Turkish coders, but they had very characteristic kinds of mistakes. Uh, create standard packages in R and Python to calculate bias metrics. We, we haven't really gone into bias metrics in our talk. For detail on that, you can see uh, Lee and Kizilcek's review, which goes into a lot more detail on this. We didn't want to replicate what they had already done. It's good work. But there are a lot of metrics out there published, but there aren't a lot of standard packages. There are packages for algorithmic bias in general, but they're incomplete. But they're not yet education specific. And some of the concerns we have in education will turn out to be a little different than other fields. Also, create reference data sets for testing new approaches. We have a lot of publicly available data sets in education, but I can't think of any that actually really get to the kind of demographic detail needed to be able to study algorithmic bias and new approaches for reducing it. To the extent that uh, data sets like the assessments uh, data sets and the cognitive tutor data sets have made it possible for people to, to compete to get the best algorithms for predicting student knowledge, um, we can do the same for algorithmic bias. Sorry, Aaron, go ahead. <clears throat> Facilitate and incentivize openness. Um, creating guidelines for academic pub publication. We all need to start working within our respective scientific societies to encourage this. To create guidelines for what, what papers should report. Um, Paquette and others have started working on initiatives like this in educational data mining. I haven't yet heard about initiatives like this in learning analytics, would love to see them. And in all of our communities, we should be pushing our communities to get people to report uh, that their algorithms aren't biased. We also need better standards for demonstrating effectiveness. We need to get beyond current practices uh, used in clearinghouses like ESSA, evidence for ESSA and the What Works Clearinghouse that treat educational interventions like they're universally effective or ineffective. We need to know where things work and for who, not just if they work. And a third measure that might be valuable um, is to learn from the, the medical field. Governmental agencies have specific algorithmic bias reviews um, in medicine. We could be doing the same. Funding for research that investigates algorithmic bias in education. We're talking to funders we know. I recently put out a set of 10 recommendations um, in learning engineering. And one of the things that bubbled up in those recommendations was algorithmic bias and fairness for learners. If you know funders in your own respective uh, situations, please talk to them and encourage them to pay attention to this. And journal special issues and publication opportunities. Computer-based learning in context. I hope you've all heard of it, but if you haven't, it's an open and free journal. Um, and CBLC is very interested in seeing work of this nature. The editor tells me so. And the Journal of Educational Data Mining has been very friendly as well to publishing work of this nature. I can't promise what the Journal of Learning Analytics attitude will be because I don't have as close of connections, but from talking to them, I think they're pretty likely to be interested in this. So another important priority um, that we discussed in the article is to begin to shift who is at the table as these models in education are developed and tested. So, we think that members of the communities with something at stake from an algorithmic decision can do a better job of advocating for their positions than even the most well-meaning technical team. Holstein et al. 2019 reports that out of a survey of 267 machine learning practitioners, only 21% reported that their team prioritized fairness a lot or a great deal, while a full 36% indicated that they prioritize fairness, not at all. So at a minimum, bringing impacted stakeholders into the discussion 
I think could go a long way towards increasing the priority of addressing bias in the development process. On this same front, we suggest work towards two slightly more specific goals. Um, first, consult stakeholders throughout the machine learning process. Uh, impacted groups can have important feedback from defining the problem or the task that a model will address um, to understanding what data to collect um, and not just provide feedback at the end of the development cycle around cosmetic or usability issues. Second, um, to get to a place where stakeholders can provide useful feedback, we need to be more intentional about creating methods that facilitate their participation and really meet them where they are. Some of these methods may focus on developing more techniques for interpreting and explaining algorithmic decisions, while others could focus on expanding the, the available toolkit of co-design methods that are tailored to machine learning and to algorithm driven products. So there's been a lot of information this session. Um, we hope that um, it's helped raise some concerns about what we don't yet know about algorithmic bias and that it's clarified some of what we do know and that it's offered some useful strategies for uh, continuing to work towards equity in education. And as Ryan mentioned before, if you're interested in taking a look at the review of the preprint, uh, the review preprint of this is uh, available if you Google Baker Hahn algorithmic bias in education. Um, so thank you so much. If we have, we have some time left and we could take questions or move into a quick activity. What do you think? Ryan? I think we have just barely enough time for the activity, especially because we've been getting some commentary in the chat window. So let's do the activity, but people awesome. who have questions can post them in chat and I can, you and I can answer them. Perfect. So let's take a few minutes. We'd like you to brainstorm on your own for a little bit about some of the actions that our research communities might take towards reducing algorithmic bias. Uh, if you're inspired, feel free to write them down in the chat or just jot them down for yourself and hold on to them for a moment. So we'll take a few minutes to brainstorm and then we'll come back together.
while there's questions coming on, I do welcome also, we do welcome also any ideas we can do to get our societies to do better. So thanks for thinking about that uh, for a little bit. Wait time is really hard in Zoom, I'm discovering. Um, if anyone has some thoughts they'd like to uh, come off mute and share, I think that'd be great. Or if you have other thoughts that you'd like to put in the chat, um, we'd love to see those. So if there's no, um, it, we don't have to share now, I'd like to move on to step two of the activity, which is surprising, um, but we'd love it for you to take time to email members of the leadership in these organizations with your suggestions at some point. Um, uh, <laughs> I think it really takes all of us to kind of get the ball rolling on this and to, to begin to, um, uh, push further as far as we can towards equitable outcomes for students and equitable equity in education. So we really encourage you to do this. Um, I'd love to open up the floor to other more general questions. If there's anything that people would like to ask about, there's been some great stuff in the chat um, that I'll try to follow up on, uh, but feel free to, to raise your hand or come off mute and I'll try to manage that. Love to open the floor for uh, Benjamin's uh, question. Benjamin, do you, can you bring it out? Yeah, sure. This is this is Benji. Um, yeah, so um, I think a lot about it's uh, kind of from the psychometrics field. You know, just like models aren't valid, data is not valid. It's all about how we interpret and use uh, the out. In this case, the outcome of the outputs of our models. Uh, so knowing that, just kind of like, what's the uh, the alignment problem, which is the, uh, what, what do we actually want? You know, like a goal, like uh, within like uh, policing is like goal is safe for communities. And then what we actually get are like models, which can enable, which can like enable over policing of certain parts of the community, right? So which is uh, one of the overarching reasons that, um, that uh, uh, predictive policing just kind of in general is failed and biased. So it's related to um, AI and education. Uh, I wonder, what are we, what do we really want, which is equity? And uh, what are the limitations related to data and, and the models that we're building that kind of leave us in like the, this is, we're doing what we know what to do uh, versus uh, figuring out uh, what do we really want or what's the, uh, what are the changes or the, the actual like equitable outcomes that we want, if that makes I sense. I really like that point. And I'll say something quick and Ryan, if you have something to add the, the uh, when we were looking at the different pipeline models, I was kind of surprised that only one of those models actually included um, defining the task as part of the process. Um, and that was a more organizationally product driven model. Um, but I feel like that's a great step, right? Like just see that your goal is part of this process to begin with. Um, 
as opposed to something that's kind of falls outside of the, the work of creating the algorithm. I, I mean, I, um, I lost my train of thought. I, I think that this happens a lot, right? I mean, there's always a point where we can't do what we want to do and we have to find some proxy. We have to find some operationalization. We have to find some, you know, as, as Herb Simon said, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. But the question is how bad is too bad, right? There becomes a certain point where we're actually misleading ourselves. We're tricking ourselves into thinking that we have a model that we don't actually have, right? Like, so yeah, it's always a case of we can't actually predict X. We can't actually get it X, but we can get it Y. And Y is good enough under certain assumptions. And if we're being smart and thoughtful, we know what those assumptions are, or we try to figure it out. And if we're not, we do things that are horrid, right? Like we, you know, we, we, um, we build a model that can detect uh, long pauses and we call it a model of off-task behavior. We take a model uh, that works in one context and we say, oh, we finally built our model works in one context. Now we'll use it everywhere, right? It's all these kind of issues where we want to do things and that's where we get in trouble. I, there's also another comment in the chat window um, from Solmaz, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, about um, how EDM learning, learn modeling folks focus mostly on predictive accuracy and ignore the other stuff. And I, gosh, I could not agree with you more. And it's endemic of the same problem. Look, I, anybody here is a computer scientist. I have, a, a, I have an undergrad computer science degree and I did a PhD at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. So I can make fun of all of us. You know, we all as computer scientists, we just want to get those numbers up, right? And so you have all these papers in learner modeling about my new algorithm gets 0.003 AUC better. And it's got all these horrible flaws that would make it impossible to use in the real world. Um, there are a few bright spots in that literature, like you in Hong Kong or, um, or you know, Hellenic in um, the Czech Republic. Um, I try to pay some attention to these issues myself that actually try to look at like attributes of algorithms that are relevant to real world use, but I couldn't agree more that there's way too much focus on numbers. Sadia, I'm intrigued by you, the fact that you got a paper rejected just for reporting demographic differences. Can you tell us more about that? Got it. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. So yeah. So she ended up taking that part out of her paper just so that it gets accepted elsewhere. So that's kind of kind of discouraging um, new researchers in just investigating these demographic differences. And I don't think it's a good idea that at this stage people are discouraged to just talk about um, such stuff. Well. I'll say two things. One is that peer based learning in context always welcomes this stuff. JDM and EDM are quite friendly to it. I don't think learning analytics or JLA are hostile to it. And if anybody knows of a journal editor who actually lets that kind of thing fly, like send them my way. I'll like come down to their office with like a, a, a pool noodle or something and like attack them. Sure, sounds good. I will say by contrast, Mariah, that I actually do think that spelling out why it matters is actually important. Why I, I do think that that explaining why demographic differences matter for the people who don't understand it is actually really valuable. And I agree, Oscar, we should like be thinking about how algorithms benefit students. We should be thinking about benefits. We should be thinking about costs. We should be thinking about all these things. We should have a much more nuanced picture. So many of the papers in learning analytics are all about the numbers, as one of the earlier comments pointed out. We shouldn't be just thinking about the numbers, we should be thinking about costs, benefits, and harms. Yeah, just to add to that, the, the point that Oscar is making about um, 
really defining the harm is is super important. And a lot of the discussion around what is bias and what are the different conflicting uh, definitions of bias has led some folks to say, like, when you're talking about this, you just need to spell out, like, what is the harm that we're looking at and who is it impacting um, to clarify what we're talking about when we talk about bias and harm. I was curious if Henry could say a bit about his point about user, um, end users and the importance of actually having a, a, a appropriate usage of the model. Um, I think that's a, a great point. Yeah, I'm happy to flesh that thought out a bit more. Um, my thinking there is that if we treat this question of bias and fairness as a purely algorithmic one, I think there's probably gonna be only so far we can get in practical terms. Um, and there may be a point of diminishing returns that we could maybe stave off if we stop putting as much work into the algorithm tuning at a certain point and go to the people who are going to be using the predictions of these models and find some way to communicate to them, you know, this model might have these sorts of tendencies, be aware of it, please try to check it. Um, I'm thinking about my position in my university. I am in a group that serves a lot of very operational data needs for campus. And so we provide a lot of information to people like uh, advisors. An advisor might be looking at the output of, uh, let's say, one of our graduation models. <clears throat> but if we kind of treat, train them in terms of what are the pros and cons, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this model, my sort of pie in the sky hope is that they might be able to mitigate any problems that our model has because they're sitting in front of a different set of information. They can just talk to the students. They have broader cultural knowledge that our model is not really going to be able to encapsulate. Um, but then on the flip side, if we fail to train end users and how to properly think about the outputs of our models, I, I'm a little worried and paranoid that there might be a risk of blindly using these predictions and then reinforcing some of the biases that we're trying to avoid. And so kind of our, our models don't really exist in the vacuum of you know, publications and our Jupyter notebooks and our Python programs. Um, they actually need to get used in the real world at some point, And that to me seems like a huge place where we can have a lot of hopefully very positive impact on potential issues of bias. But that turned a little bit rambly, but I hope that um, helped kind of clarify my thought there. <laughs> no, that's great. I, I really recommend um, you know, Ken Holstein's writing about how to bring practitioners into the design process for these kind of products. Um, and there's some kind of uh, literature on like the socio-technical front that really gets at um, some of these questions also, like how far can we go with just a technical definition of algorithm bias or a technical solution? So I think we're running up to the last minutes here. This has been a really great discussion. Thank you all. and I. Appreciate the feedback and suggestions and thoughts that will refine this as we take forward our paper. Um, yeah, thank you all. Um, feel free to join continue the conversation. Uh, Justin, there's a discussion form where people can do that, right? Yes, that is correct. Um, in our LALN resource hub, uh, which you can find through our website here, and we'll post all the materials there website as well. And um, again, we will um, have some future events coming up this summer too. Um, and again, if you are interested in seeing those, um, make sure to follow us on Twitter or uh, follow us on our website as well. I invite you to come to that. And just want to thank Aaron and Ryan, a great session today. Um, are there any other questions that we want to uh, talk about right now? Um, if not, um, I'll go ahead and uh, stop the recording at this time. And again, I want to thank you all for joining tonight.
or this morning or evening, wherever you're at. <laughs>